Yeah. You know, so uh, one of the things that NASI did as part of this pricing project was we commissioned some work with some some academics at the University of Pennsylvania and uh, a guy named Jeff Goldsmith who runs a, a firm called Health Futures in, in Charlottesville, uh, Virginia. And he did a study of integrated delivery networks, uh, delivery systems um, around the country and looked at, and so these are the, the big health systems like Intermountain Health and um, uh, the sort of Kaiser-like systems of the, of the country um, that are often held up as the future. I mean, and part of what's going on here is, is also, it's not just market positioning, it's also policy is driving this. All this discussion of ACOs and alternative quality contracts has also been pushing these providers towards, towards vertical integration. Anyway, Goldsmith and, and, and uh, the other folks looked at the financial performance of these organizations just from the data that they reported. And, you know, it was really interesting. It's not that, uh, we, he could not say that these did not have any benefit, but he certainly could say that if you look at the data that's publicly available, uh, there is not a clear evidence that these uh, entities are either uh, beneficial to the health systems themselves or to the public. So if you look at things like physician cost and hospital pricing and per capita medical spending, you don't see, they're going way up in these, these integrated delivery systems. If you look at things like length of stay and, and um, clinical indicators, those are not going down necessarily with these health systems. So, um, you know, it's sort of really unclear what kind of benefit these systems are delivering uh, to society. You know, at the same time, um, the way we traditionally uh, regulate mergers and acquisitions is through antitrust law. And there's sort of a clear body of knowledge on what to do with horizontal mergers and acquisitions. Um, but with vertical uh, ac uh, transactions, it's not quite yet clear where that fits into in the, in the antitrust law. There was recently a case out in Idaho that was really, could have been a, a sort of a, a seminal signal on where, where the courts want to go on this, with a big uh, hospital uh, buying out the big um, group practice in the, in the community. Um, and it was settled, you know, on sort of other terms. It was, or it was, it was, uh, the decision came on other terms besides the vertical integration quality. So it's really not clear yet where the courts want to go with this in terms of how it fits into our antitrust law. Thank you. <clears throat> the next question we're going to direct to Joe. Um, how do public health marketplaces impact purchasing of coverage by employers for baby boomers, both early retirees and current employees? Thanks, Eric. Uh, I'm going to just preface my remarks by highlighting I, I work uh, with groups, the typically groups providing coverage for former employees, so early retirees, Medicare retirees. So that segment of the market tends to be, A, a lot of public sector, although many still private sector, older retirees, uh, but also among larger employers and not the really small end of the market. So consider that when considering, uh, you know, my perspective and, and, and viewpoints here. Uh, in terms of the public marketplaces, so the exchanges, and this is all really today and looking forward, assuming that King versus Burwell that we'll hear about later this month doesn't uh, uh, cause a major change and disrupt the uh, federal tax uh, credits, which obviously uh, could have a significant impact in terms of the, uh, the marketplace for the exchanges. Uh, generally speaking, we're not seeing employers, again, larger employers, uh, looking to, uh, as an alternative, to drop coverage for current employees. Uh, typically, the pay or play requirements and other considerations, business competitiveness and the like, have really not uh, created much interest in exiting coverage for current employees uh, for uh, plan sponsors. Uh, for early retirees, uh, a very different story, uh, quite frankly. The uh, ACA, having created exchanges, has obviously created guaranteed issue, no medical underwriting options, limited aging in terms of uh, uh, rates uh, for the older population. Obviously, the 60 to 64-year-olds, typical early retirees, are the most costly segment of the, the marketplace, older uh, not healthy, more health conditions, and prior to, uh, to having Medicare, uh, for plan sponsors who provide coverage to those individuals, uh, the ACA really provides an opportunity uh, for 
perhaps more cost-effective coverage through the inherent subsidies that are out there for this segment of the marketplace uh, in the ratings because of the limited uh, age sloping, the lack of underwriting, et cetera. And in fact, many times the retirees who are covered in those plans are already something of a, a less healthy uh, segment, if you will, of an overall population, whereas some of those early retirees who might otherwise be in those plans have already opted out to because they have another job where they are getting coverage or through a spouse's option because the coverage was unaffordable for them. They were able to purchase coverage on their own and pass medical underwriting in years past. Uh, so they tend to be a, an unhealthy uh, segment, if you will, of early retirees often that are covered in those plans, especially if the employer subsidy is not covering uh, the lion's share uh, of the cost. Uh, we're seeing a lot of interest uh, looking forward in converting those plans perhaps to uh, mechanisms uh, with defined contribution toward purchase of individual coverage. Here's some money, go out on your own and, and buy, uh, buy your own coverage uh, in the individual marketplace along with support uh, through, uh, through various mechanisms, call centers and the like, online tools to help folks navigate, uh, whether it's a state exchange or a federally facilitated exchange uh, for that coverage. So I think that's uh, a significant uh, wave that we think is coming uh, in the next few years, uh, perhaps m as are most changes, more so in the private sector first uh, before the public sector, which tends to be slower uh, to change and slower to uh, uh, move folks off of uh, traditional retiree uh, coverage or health plans for that matter. Uh, but uh, that is something that uh, that we do see uh, coming uh, down the line is uh, uh, the expectation of many early retirees who are getting coverage today or anticipating getting coverage in the next few years through an employer group plan instead being uh, given the option or not necessarily the option, rather uh, here is your new plan. Uh, go purchase coverage on your own, perhaps with, uh, you know, an employer subsidy. And it may well be a generous subsidy, uh, but uh, it may prove to be more cost efficient uh, for the individuals in many cases. That's not to say in all cases. Uh, obviously depends on specific circumstances, prices of plans available in the marketplace where individuals live and individual utilization uh, and the like. Uh, but uh, certainly uh, is something that uh, we think uh, will be uh, a significant market uh, change uh, in the coming few years. And we're seeing uh, the, uh, the early stages of that now as uh, some employers have already made that uh, move for 1115 uh, or are uh, anticipating doing so for, uh, for 1116. So, Joe, kind of following up on that same theme but a little different twist on it, how has the Affordable Care Act uh, changed the marketplace for Medicare-eligible retirees with employer-sponsored group secondary coverage. Yeah. And actually, if I had to do over again, I'd probably reverse the order of the, uh, the questions here, uh, those two, because the, the pre-65 exits that I just described in many uh, ways uh, are the next step in the evolution of uh, the uh, exit from group-sponsored coverage. Uh, we're seeing two major uh, changes uh, in the Medicare marketplace for group coverage. Uh, and really two divergent paths. The historical path and perhaps still the most common path uh, for those public and private sector employers who provide coverage to Medicare retirees is a secondary plan that coordinates with original Medicare in some way, typically uh, through some coordination of benefits, be it uh, carve-out, non-duplication of benefits, Medicare exclusion, or other uh, complicated methods where the plan figures out what it pays after Medicare has paid its 80 percent or its share depending upon uh, the specific claim. And we see and have seen millions of retirees moved off of those plans to either one of two paths, uh, group Medicare Advantage plans uh, which have uh, reduced costs for public and private sector employers and retirees alike, allowing uh, managed care into Medicare. You know, we talked a lot about fee-for-service uh, previously on the earlier questions, and traditional Medicare, original Medicare still operates largely in a fee-for-service uh, environment, although I know there's a lot of expectation around change in the coming years. 
and the introduction of managed care uh, into Medicare. Uh, for those who aren't familiar, familiar Medicare Advantage is where uh, CMS Medicare pays the insurer a fixed capitated payment every month for every individual who enrolls in coverage, and those payments are adjusted depending upon health, static and health status and geographic and demographic factors. And then the uh, health plan is managing the full coverage. So instead of having Medicare and a secondary plan, you now have one overall plan providing coverage uh, to the retirees, uh, typically a network-based uh, plan, and uh, the ability to manage the care holistically, the full dollar, and not just have a plan that's paying secondary to Medicare, which is really just a small piece of it, and enables uh, a lot of cost-efficient programs to be put in place, uh, whether it's through negotiation <laughs> with providers in terms of uh, risk sharing of the like, ACOs or other mechanisms, or whether through just more traditional uh, care management uh, solutions, disease management, uh, discharge planning uh, with retirees. One of the things we've seen is, uh, for those who may not be familiar, under traditional Medicare, one in six individuals who is discharged from a hospital is readmitted within 30 days for the same condition, one in six. And it really highlights a lack of discharge planning or care coordination uh, following the, uh, the discharge uh, from the hospital for those individuals. Uh, under Medicare Advantage, uh, overall, I think that number is uh, one in seven, uh, dropping a little bit uh, for the most recent data I've seen. I, I can tell you that under our Medicare Advantage plans, uh, it's one in nine and uh, still not where we'd like it to be, but ultimately uh, something that we think is, you know, uh, ultimately uh, a strong goal is to get that as low as, uh, you know, possible. Uh, obviously, there's always going to be some, uh, some readmissions and, and a fair number, uh, but we feel that's a significant example of where there is uh, potential uh, ability to squeeze cost out of the system uh, to the benefit of all. I mean, obviously, uh, if an individual does not need to be readmitted to the hospital, they're better off, and the plan is better off, the employer plan sponsor is better off. Uh, really, I think it's one where everyone's interests uh, are, are aligned. So group Medicare Advantage being one solution that we've seen uh, that has grown substantially over the last few years. And then the other is uh, an exit to the individual uh, marketplace, uh, which has uh, also uh, grown uh, post-ACA uh, in that um, employers moving uh, retirees to individual plans, offering them a defined contribution subsidy to purchase Medicare supplement, individual Medicare Advantage, Part D, uh, drug plans. Uh, this is something that has been uh, very popular uh, in the private sector. Uh, a lot of uh, large brand name employers uh, have made that move in the past few years. Uh, so we've seen uh, tremendous movement, millions of retirees uh, in the past uh, five years, I'd say, I'd say, moving to either one of those two paths, the individual market purchase of coverage, of getting away from group coverage with an employer subsidy, or moving to the group Medicare Advantage solutions uh, that I described as well. It's fascinating and extremely complex, um, <clears throat> which brings up a question, you know, how, is, how are senior citizens uh, going to deal with this? What are the financial challenges that most seniors face with regard to health care services and costs? I mean, how, how do you implement that into a, a planning system uh, for individuals going forward uh, so they have some idea of how much they need to save to cover the health care part, health care cost part of retirement. Do you want to go first on that one? Sure, sure. So, um, I mean, I think we touched upon this a little bit yesterday with this GAO study <clears> saying <throat> that more than half of people over 55 had no retirement savings. Um, I think if you, the other interesting sort of side of that is if you look at people who do have retirement savings, people between ages 55 and 65 have on average, or I should say a median savings of uh, about 104000 And for people between 65 and 74, uh, the median savings goes up to about 148000 So this is not a lot of money. This, when you translate this to annuities, it's 300 and $600 a month. It's, it's, it's uh, uh, you know, people who are not flush. Um, and at the same time, if you look at the, the, the sort of demand side on their lives, the out-of-pocket costs have been going up tremendously. 
over between 2000 and 2010, out-of-pocket costs for seniors on Medicare went up 44 um, percent. So there's a significant uh, uh, demand side on their pocketbook. And, and of course, that's, that's an average number. So for people who are either lower income uh, or in poor health um, or more on the older side, those costs are going to go up dramatically more. Uh, I think, um, to your point, uh, I think it was Fidelity who estimated that a couple turning 65 uh, currently uh, can expect between uh, Part B premiums, Part D premiums, and out-of-pocket expenses. I think it's uh, north of 200000 now over the rest of their lifetime in terms of uh, out-of-pocket medical costs. So um, it is a significant uh, <laughs> challenge. I don't know that I have a solution for it. I'd say that uh, in some ways, you know, I would argue Medicare Advantage plans, which are now being chosen uh, by just about one out of two individuals who are aging into uh, Medicare, presumably because you have a generation that is more familiar with more managed care, more accepting of managed care. They've had managed care uh, while they were uh, working and, and had uh, group coverage. Uh, I think that's one way that can help reduce those costs. Very often, Medicare Advantage plans um, have zero premium as opposed to the, uh, uh, you know, the uh, Medicare supplement plans, which provide additional cost. Uh, but it is, a, it is a real challenge. I mean, the bottom line is there is some cost sharing under Medicare. You're talking about a population that typically uses a lot of uh, health care, uh, uses a lot of prescription drugs uh, as well, even with Part D coverage. Uh, the out-of-pocket costs are, uh, you know, still significant. Okay, kind of a follow-up or corollary to that uh, for Joel. Uh, should financial challenges facing seniors induce changes in Medicare benefits, such as allowing beneficiaries to share in any ACO savings? Uh, yeah, I, I think um, that these challenges that, that Lee and Joe were, have just been talking about you know, and when, when you look at what's going on with the value-based models and, and HHS and Medicare's determination to move more and more physicians and hospitals to value-based models, there's a potential for a happy convergence of revisiting and changing some of the Medicare benefits, which the basic Medicare benefit package has not changed very much. If, if at all, in the last several years. ACOs being an interesting example. I mean, how, how do ACOs work? The, the, the basic idea behind Medicare's Medicare Shared Savings Program is that if a group of providers who form an ACO are able to keep their costs below a trend, they're going to share up to 50% or they get about 50 percent of the savings. The vast majority of ACOs in the Medicare Shared Savings Program are in this so-called upside-only track. There are a couple of ACOs that also take downside risk, but again, vast majority upside. Um, you know, why, and, and I'm just speaking personally, this isn't the position of Blue Cross Blue Shield Association, but it would seem at least to warrant a conversation among policymakers whether beneficiaries should get a piece of that pie. If they're going to an ACO and that ACO achieves savings, shared savings, should some of those shared savings trickle down in the form of reduced cost sharing or reduced premiums to beneficiaries? I think that's just an example of of how changes in the delivery and payment model can also pull along and, and perhaps encourage changes on, on the benefit side. Even in Medicare Advantage, there are things that a Medicare Advantage plan or, or a managed care plan in the private sector can do that Medicare Advantage plans can't do or it's very difficult to do. I'll give you two examples, tiering. As, as I mentioned earlier, a lot, a lot of private plans, a lot of private employers are using tiering to steer people towards high-value providers, whether it be a center of excellence or providers who perform well on, perform, on quality measures, 
and do it in a very efficient way. It's very difficult, if not impossible, for Medicare Advantage plans to set up benefit designs that have tiers. And, and just by the way, this tiers um, uh, t tiering is is something that um, is is a major feature of many products in the public exchanges. The other thing that Medicare Advantage plans can't do is take advantage of, and pardon the other buzzword, but its uh, buzz term is value-based insurance design, which, um, just to give you an example, value-based insurance design might be one which lowers or eliminates the cost sharing for drugs for people with certain chronic conditions. So if you have diabetes and, and perhaps other, other comorbidities, the cost sharing for your diabetes drug would be zero to encourage you to adhere and take your diabetes drug. That, that, that's probably the most basic sort of value-based insurance design, and Medicare Advantage plans can't do that. So, you know, there, there's a lot of opportunity uh, that really hasn't received much conversation among policymakers yet to revise the Medicare benefit in ways that can relieve some of the pressure on beneficiaries. Um, and maybe that $200,000 becomes a mere 150000 I, I I don't know, but, you know, but every dollar helps. So, you know, um, there's sort of, there's a lurking policy dilemma here, though. I mean, I think Joel raises, and Eric raises a really uh, a good policy question about the shared savings and, and whether consumers can have a piece of that. You know, right now, if you're a Medicare beneficiary, if you, um, if you want to sign up for managed care, for managed, uh, a Medicare Advantage plan, that's great. You can do that. You get certain additional benefits. You also give up certain flexibility in terms of you need to go to their providers. You need to stay in network. Um, one of the things that ACOs are really such a breakthrough about and people are excited about it, is it's a way of trying to get the integration and the coordination of managed care, but without forcing people into networks. Because what it does is it says to physicians, um, you know, if you can keep your costs down for your group of patients, you can have a share of the savings. But your patients, it's the patients that are attributed to you. Your patients actually don't have to sign up for an ACO. There's nothing that limits their choice of where they go to their doctor. You may decide to go to a different cardiologist than the one that's in, that you've been going to that's maybe part of an ACO. And, and, but the fact that he's in an ACO doesn't limit your ability to go to a different one. And so I think if there's a question of whether consumers want to get a piece of the savings, then it raises the question of maybe they need to commit to the practice, right? And I don't know if I mean, that's an issue that, you know, that raises some fundamental issues of choices and flexibility that always is a problem for American consumers. Um, you know, more, some people are more comfortable with it than others. So. Kind of a dollars for freedom exchange, I think, is what, yeah. what we're driving to. Yeah. Yet all the the price of health care seems to be going up year after year, and and our outcomes seem to be a little more dim than they used to be, and you know, ranking with uh, with other nations. So, what's going to keep the cost of health care in check, or are we just going to have to live with kind of limitless uh, increases each year? Lee? Yeah. Or, so, or um, Joe, either one? Sure. So I'll, I'll start and pick up. Uh, I mean, I think there's two things. One is you have to look at both the level of health care spending and the growth, right? So the level, we spend so much more than other countries. And it's, I think as uh, we touched upon yesterday, it's, it's because of inf uh, prices that, that we charge and because of administrative costs involving insurance. Um, it's not about utilization. You know, we, we have, uh, a fewer admissions, we see doctors less often than they do in Europe uh, per capita. We have a younger population. Um, it's really about uh, prices and, and administrative costs. Now, what drives those prices over time? Um, you know, that's both a question of, of volume and intensity. And of course, as we're aging, the intensity of the services uh, uh, we use uh, go up. And same thing with technology. Um, there was a study in health affairs at the beginning of the year. Uh, that said um, they were looking at health care costs going back and health care costs going forward. And these were some CMS actuaries. And they said 
uh, they estimated that between 50 and 80 percent of the recent increase in health spending um, was driven by prices. So a lot of this is, is driven by the prices that we charge um, more than the fact that, more than, say, the, the consumption of health care per se. I, I would add that I, I think it has to do with the, uh, the incentives, largely. You know, Joel gave a great example earlier uh, about hospitals buying provider practices and the cost of prescriptions going from 10000 to 32000 uh, per month. I think it's really about getting those incentives uh, properly uh, aligned so that uh, we're able to, you know, we talk about value-based purchasing and other options. Uh, I, I think that's, you know, ultimately um, – in a variety of different ways within that, but that's how uh, we'll perhaps be able to control the, uh, the unit cost better. And I think there are steps uh, that are headed in, in the right direction, but obviously, uh, you know, a system that represents one-sixth of, uh, of our economy uh, takes, uh, uh, you know, a, 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 some time to, uh, to make such uh, dramatic changes across so many uh, elements of it. So you want to comment on the policy changes that have been made to try to solve these issues, or...? and whether the changes we've done to date have been successful? Uh, either Lee or Joel? Um, yeah, let, and let me just um, add, add, while there's a prominent health economist, Uwe Reinhardt, who, who wrote an article in Health Affairs a couple of years ago, ago called It's the Price is Stupid. To your point, Lee, where, I mean, his, his contention is that the prices that we, that we pay are so much higher. I mean, doctors earn so much more here relative to the median worker than any other country, et cetera. But, but I don't want to underplay the role of, of utilization. To, to, least, to, to, to Joe's point, I'm sorry, about readmissions, I mean, every readmission, that, that's unnecessary utilization. And if that utilization can be avoided, that's a lot of money saved. If a medical home can reduce use of emergency rooms, and we have evidence now from medical homes and various blue plans that have been in place several years that emergency room use goes down, you know, anywhere from 10, 15 to 20 percent, that's going to save money. We know that there's a connection between overcapacity of, of delivery and, and cost, you know, there have been upteen studies showing that, you know, the average American city in the United States has more MRI machines and CAT scanners than all of Canada, you know, slight, slight exaggeration. But when you've got a lot of MRI machines, you use them. Um, and what, what Blue Plans, for example, have found is that uh, in the last several years, costs of imaging we're climbing by double digits. I think, um, correct me if I'm wrong, Joe, but there's a period where imaging costs, advanced imaging, was increasing 20 to 30 percent a year. And it's back in the, in the mid-2000s. It had nothing to do with price. It was, it was overutilization. And what a lot of plans have done is put in place prior authorization programs Nobody likes those. You know, it's kind of mother may I. But miraculously, overutilization stopped and the cost trend stopped. So price is very important. Unit prices is very important. Administrative costs, you, we, we could argue about exactly how really important that is. I, I, I don't think that's a major driver of our $3 trillion economy, but utilization is important too. And the sort of things we we're talking about, value -based, the value-based payment models, those don't really address price. Those address utilization. And, you know, ultimately, if a, if a medical home is able to take better care of a person, whether it's a Medicare beneficiary or a commercial enrollee, who's got diabetes and is overweight and has pulmonary problems and, you know, et cetera, et cetera, and they can keep them out of the hospital and they can keep them out of the emergency room and they can help them reduce weight and, and all these things, they're going to use fewer services, they're going to be healthier, and that's going to save money. And, and we actually, 
although Lee is right, the jury is still out on how well programs like this might work nationwide. We do have a lot of evidence, whether it be from programs United have, whether it be from individual programs that Blue Sh Cross Blue Shield plans have, that medical homes or ACOs, improvements in coordinating care, improvements in helping physicians identify those patients at greatest risk of problems do save money, and they can save money in a way that doesn't harm quality. Okay, uh, <clears throat> a question uh, for Lee. Do the new Medicare payments models provide useful models for change? Uh, yeah, yes, I mean, I think <clears throat> we've, we've, we've kind of talked about that um, a lot today, and I, you know, I think it's one of the, it's one of the, stories about the ACA that really doesn't get enough attention, right? There's so much focus on other parts of it that are more controversial, um, but they really do. And, and because it's, it's through government programs, it's, it's through Medicare and Medicaid, so it's sort of distinct elements of the population, whether it's people who are seniors or people who are uh, low-income people. Um, but, uh, you know, a lot of this is, is is hand in hand with what's happening in the private sector too. You know, I think it's as, as Joel and, and Joe have, have talked about what, what their organizations have done. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think they're, they're really important elements of, of system reform. Okay. 